welcome you to this portion of our uh, doctrinal conference this week. Uh, we were scheduling ap apostolic apologetics during this hour, and, and we received a, a call from one of the local pastors after receiving our announcement and uh, very intrigued by what we're discussing today. And uh, so he asked if he could participate via a debate, and um, we consented. And uh, this is good for all of us. Uh, if you read in the book of Acts, Paul spent a lot of time and energy in defense of his faith and uh, spent, I think in one place, three years opening and, let, and alleging in the temple and, uh, and they, in the places of, of sophistry and philosophy in defense of his faith. And uh, we thank God for this opportunity to do so again. Pastor Gene Cook uh, asked if he could uh, engage us in a debate concerning uh, this all-important question of the Trinity. And uh, the, the basis of it is going to be on the co-eternal, co-existent, eternally begotten question uh, of the Godhead. So uh, we have a format to this debate. There's a time allotted for each one of these, Pastor David Bernard and Pastor Gene Cook. And uh, the format will go as follows. There will be a 15-minute opening from each one of them and then a five-minute rebuttal. So each one will be able to rebut uh, the previous uh, presentation, five minutes apiece. <clears throat> and then there's a 10-minute question period where each one will be able to ask each other questions in a 10-minute allotment. And each one will be given a three-minute closing statement. It's not a, a free-for-all uh, format. We will never get done that way. Uh, so there has to be some order. Now, remember, if you um, get into extensive applause and uh, hold up the speaker, you're taking his time. All right? So we want you to, you can express your approval, but don't hold up the answer that's being given because uh, there's an, only a certain allotment of time for that answer or statement. And we also want to be Christian-like in our response. We don't need hoop, 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 you know. <clears throat> we want to be uh, courteous to each person. You can express your approval. We say amen around here. All right? We do say that. So um, you can express your approval or, or uh, appreciation for the answer, uh, but also uh, let's be courteous uh, to each side. Uh, so today, uh, without much further ado, now Minister Bridges, Elder Bridges will be the timekeeper and uh, at the point of one minute to the uh, end of the answer, he will raise a sign, a fan, and then when the time is up, he'll raise the fan again. And uh, that will be uh, time's up. So Pastor David Bernard will be going first and then Pastor Gene Cook will follow up. We're so glad to have uh, this great man of God with us, and uh, I want you to receive him with your utmost appreciation, Pastor David Bernard. Thank you, and we give glory to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, we appreciate Bishop Trout for this opportunity, and uh, Pastor Cook for also participating. And so without further ado, I'm going to get right into what I have to say. The, I'm speaking on behalf of the teaching of one God, the doctrine of one God, and in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let me start with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, which is the fundamental or well, the foundation of the Old Testament, the fundamental creed of ancient Judaism and even to this day. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So here we have a clear emphasis, the fact that there is one God. 
That is to be taught at every opportunity. That is the foundation. That is the basis. A scribe came to Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, and asked him, which is the, great, the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So I am stating the proposition that there is absolutely one indivisible God. We cannot speak of God's plural. We cannot speak of persons of God. If we mean by persons, multiple personalities, multiple minds, multiple wills, uh, multiple bodies uh, in the Godhead. In fact, I would say you can't be in the Godhead. The Godhead is the quality of being God, and there is no one in the Godhead. The Godhead is not a, a substance. The Godhead is a person. The one true God known in the Old Testament as Jehovah or Yahweh, the supreme name by which he revealed himself to Israel. When he manifested himself in the flesh, he became Jesus, known as Jesus, which the word literally means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah is salvation. So there's one indivisible God with no distinction of persons. That's my first point. And my second point is Jesus is the incarnation of that one undivided Godhead. He is not one of three persons. He is not a subordinate person. He is not a second person. But he is the Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the incarnation of the fullness of God. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, we find this statement speaking of Jesus Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is the sum total of God's character, quality, attributes, personality. It's everything that makes him who he is. And God was incarnate or enfleshed bodily in Jesus Christ. When I say flesh or body, I'm not only speaking of the physical flesh, but usually in the Bible, flesh refers to human nature. And so I would say Jesus had the complete identity of humanity except for sin. Sin is a foreign element intruded into humanity. So I'm absolutely not saying that Jesus had a sinful nature, but I absolutely am saying anything we humans have, Jesus had joined inseparably to the Spirit of God so that you have one God manifested in the flesh as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I want to emphasize that. Now, the teaching of one God is persistent throughout the Scriptures and in such a way that it would exclude the concept of multiple persons. What I want to show you for a few moments, this is not just a, a minor point. This is absolutely essential to understanding everything else. Our doctrine derives foremost from the New Testament, but the Old Testament is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. If, if we are studying calculus and trigonometry, we've got to make sure the arithmetic is right. The New Testament doctrine uh, is first and foremost the clearest exposition of our salvation and so on. The fullest revelation of truth is in the New Testament, but to get us there... The concepts and terms have to be defined for us, and God did that through the people of God, uh, of the Old Testament, the Jews. When we come to the New Testament, we cannot read it from the point of view of 4th century Greek philosophy, take those definitions, and then we see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or one God, or Godhead, define it in terms of philosophy. Rather, we need to start from the Old Testament as far as our theological education, understand who the one God is, and what it means to talk about Father and Holy Spirit and so on. And then when we have that clear understanding of those elementary things, then when we come to the greater revelation of the New Testament, we will be in a position to receive it. Isaiah chapter 43, I'll just quickly give you some examples that show you the emphasis on one God and the strongest possible language. Not only the sense of unity, of composite attributes, but a sense of absolute singleness, aloneness, numerical oneness, just like I am one person. I may have many attributes. You can speak of my body, soul, spirit, mind, will, but I'm one person who relates. I may relate in different ways, have different ways of self-revelation, different relationships, different titles, but in essence, all those point back to the one and the same being. And the terminology of Isaiah is an example. Isaiah 43, 10, and 11. Uh, Isaiah 43, 10, the last part, Before me there was no God formed, neither after me, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. 
I am the Lord. Lord is in large and small capitals, signifying that in the original Hebrew, it was actually the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Not just the generic title Lord, meaning master, but the personal name of the God of the Old Testament. He said, I'm the only Savior. There's no other Savior beside me. Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. If you want to think of it symbolically or if you want to think of it literally, it's the same. But if you're expecting one God sitting beside another God or one person sitting beside another person, Jehovah God says that's not going to happen. I am alone. I, there's none beside me. Verse 8, fear you not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 44, 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. When he created, he did it all alone, and he did it all by himself. No one helped him. No one counseled with him. He did it by himself. Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord, there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 46, 5, to whom will you liken me? Make me equal and compare me that we may be like. So there's nobody that's God's equal. No one Jehovah's equal. Verse 9, remember the former things of old. For I am God, there's none else. I am God and there is none like me. If you find someone who's exactly like God in every way, you found God. Because there's no one who's exactly like God and yet a different being or person other than God. Well, I could go on and on, but I think you see the point. Number one, there's one God in the most absolute since you could think of one God, numerically one, alone, by myself, none else, none beside me, none like me, and so on. I will not share my glory with another. Also, when we come to the New Testament, we find that Jesus is the revelation of that one God. Jehovah says, I am the only Savior. Let me uh, read also in Isaiah 45, 21 through 23. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, have not I the Lord. There is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, and righteousness shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That is a prophecy. Jehovah said one day every knee is going to bow to me, every tongue is going to swear or confess to me. That prophecy is fulfilled in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, where it says, at the name of Jesus, literally at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We do not deny the Father, but we confess Him. When we recognize who Jesus is, we are giving glory to the one true God, the Father, because the one true God has manifest Himself in the name and person of Jesus Christ. And so what we understand is Jesus is the fulfillment. Now, Jehovah said everybody's going to bow to me. Jesus in the New Testament, is going, that's going to be the fulfillment. Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament revealed in the flesh. Jehovah says, I'm the only Savior. If you want to be saved, you have to look to me. How can we say Jesus is my Savior? Only if we recognize he's the Jehovah of the Old Testament manifest in the flesh. Now, when we say Jehovah of the Old Testament... Jehovah cannot be divided or subdivided. We're not saying one part of Jehovah or uh, one aspect of Jehovah. We're saying Jehovah, the one that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Jehovah, our uh, the Lord, is one Lord. is one Jehovah. There's only one. Now, you may ask, in that, if that's true, why does the Bible speak of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And let me say at the outset, we certainly do acknowledge the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we do not believe they represent different persons. As a simple human analogy, I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a husband. I have different relationships and different ways of making myself known, but I'm one person and my name is David Bernard. That's an analogy of how God can be our father. He's our father in creation. Uh, he came in flesh as the son of God, as our redeemer, and uh, he fills our hearts today as the Holy Spirit. Uh, God in action. He can do all those things simultaneously and yet be one God, not have separate minds or distinct minds or centers of consciousness. There's only one center of consciousness in God. We talk about persons, we'll try to define it. It's not a scriptural word used of God. The Bible never speaks of God as persons, plural, as three persons, or as a trinity. And so I'm not just against 
uh, the words, because they're not in the Bible, but the concepts behind the words are not in there either. I find it counterproductive to use those words that don't relate to concepts. But if you're going to talk about persons, if you mean a role, if you mean a manifestation, I can say God was manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. The manifestation of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, that's fine. If, but if you mean persons in the sense of centers of consciousness, there's one center of consciousness speaking to another center of consciousness, one center of consciousness thinking one thing and another center of consciousness thinking another thing. Go to heaven, there's one body sitting on this throne and another body sitting on that throne. Or one body on this throne and one, one invisible visible spirit that's not invested in that body that you see then that's where I have a problem thinking you could have one God when you have these different bodies or different centers of consciousness or whatever so if we're going to speak of God in a plural sense of persons we have to define what that means but God is our father in the sense of parental relationship. The word father is a term of relationship. Before my children were born, I was not a father. When they were born, I suddenly became a father. I did not change my nature, my personality. I didn't split into two. I didn't become a different person. But I entered a new relationship. And I'm just pointing out, when we say our father, God, our father, we're speaking of God in relationship to humanity. Deuteronomy 32.6 speaks of God as the father of the nation of Israel. Malachi 2.10, God is the father of all creation, and so on. In a unique way, God is the father of the baby Jesus because Joseph did not cause the conception. The one who causes conception by definition is the father, and the spirit of God supernaturally caused a virgin to conceive, so God was literally the father of the baby Jesus. That's all relationship to humanity. God is the father of born-again believers. That's a relationship. The Bible speaks of God as the Holy Spirit, not a different person. God is the only Holy One. Over 50 times, the Bible speaks of God as the Holy One. Never Holy Two, Holy Three, Holy Trinity, anything like that. Always Holy One. God is a spirit, John 4, 21, 4. There's only one spirit of God, Ephesians 4. And so when we say the Holy Spirit, that is not a different person from God. That is God in his spiritual nature. And that title speaks of God in spiritual action. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was out formed, void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. First mention of the Spirit, God in action. When we think of God in relationship, we pray our Father. When we think of God in spiritual work and action, we say the Holy Spirit is moving here. We don't say the Father is moving here because that implies we're looking for some personage. But we say the Spirit is here. We know we're talking about the invisible power and presence of God. The Son is God manifested in the flesh. The Bible never says the eternal Son, only the begotten Son. It never says God the Son, always Son of God. Luke 1.35 tells us why Jesus is the Son of God. The angel told Mary that, uh, uh, that the Holy Ghost would overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Therefore, because God is causing the conception, that's why the Son is called the Son. When the fullness of the time was come, Galatians 4.4, 4, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. The, the Son is the human incarnation of God. God manifested in the flesh. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God. And it's all wrapped up in Jesus. In him dwelleth all, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 1 Timothy 3.16, God manifests in the flesh. Titus 2.13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. John 20.28, 20, Jesus is called my Lord and my God. John 1.1 1, 1 and 14, the Word was God, with God was God, and the Word became flesh. There's no doubt that Jesus is the one true God. When we say the one true God, we mean the God of the Old Testament, all of His fullness. He is revealed as the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, and uh, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be here representing what the Bible teaches. We need to understand something from the outset. That is, much of what Mr. Bernard has explained in his opening statement, I am in agreement with. I would say that I was probably in agreement with about 90% of everything he believes. Uh, I believe that there is one God, just as he quoted Deuteronomy ch chapter 6, verse 4. I believe that that one God is the Savior, Isaiah 44, verse 6. All of those things I believe. And so the crux of our debate this morning is on 
this concept of God revealed in three persons? That's the question. We need to understand that we both believe that there is one God. We both believe that the Father is God. We both believe that the Son is God. We both believe that the Holy Spirit is God. The question is, do these three coexist, and are they co-eternal at the same place and the same time? We could bring a Jehovah Witness up to this platform, and the Jehovah Witness could give us a very, a very polished package and a very polished explanation of his beliefs. But he would do so to the neglect of much of what the Bible has to say. We must take the Bible as a whole. And I would agree with Mr. Bernard that the Old Testament, the law, is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. And so we should not be surprised that God begins to reveal himself in more than one person from the beginning. And I will, I will, I will prove that as we open the scriptures. But before I go there, we need to understand something else from the outset. That is that Mr. Bernard and I, and those who are in agreement with Mr. Bernard's position, we don't worship the same God. We worship two different gods. Let us be perfectly clear. If he says that God is not in three persons, and I say that God does exist in three persons at the same place and the same time, we are talking about two different things. We are talking about two different gods. His God is no more my God than the God of Mormonism, in that Mormons also believe that Jesus is God and that the Father is God, yet they believe in a multiplicity of gods. So we need to be clear from the outset that we are worshiping different gods. We are serving different gods. We could both be wrong, or one of us could be right. That's the question. And in many ways, this is like a trial, a trial where I am presenting my understanding of how God has revealed himself, and Mr. Bernard is presenting his understanding. I need to make a, cru a, cru a crucial distinction, however. God is not on trial. God has revealed himself. What is on trial here is my understanding of God and Mr. Bernard's understanding of God. And if we are to know anything about who God is and how he has revealed himself, we are only going to know that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, if this was just uh, a debate for the sake of, uh, uh, of a scholarly discussion on you know, whatever discussion, whatever topic we might agree upon, I would not participate because I would not be convinced that any of us could have a change of mind apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. So we must look to him. However, as uh, a person here present this morning, if the, truth should be com uh, sh if the truth should be proclaimed and we should fight against that truth, then we are in fact more guilty than we were before we came through the doors. God holds us accountable for that which we have heard. And this morning I believe you are going to be taken to a new level of accountability. That is that you are going to be shown the scriptures before your eyes. You're going to see that the Father and the Son exist in the same place at the same time, and they are, in fact, separate persons. I'd like to begin by opening the Bible to Genesis chapter 1. If the doctrine of the Trinity is true, then we should expect to find it in the Old Testament. And what do you know? We find it on the very first page of the Bible. In verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read this. I'm going to read off the monitor because I have the New American Standard, and this is the King James, and I'd like you to follow along with me. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, both male and female, he created them. Back to verse 26, please. In verse 26, notice, God says, Let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. The doctrine of the Trinity is not something that men have devised by pure imagination, but it's something that is revealed on the very first page of Scripture. There you have a plurality. Who are these us? Why does God speak in such terms? Let us make God in our image. As Mr. Bernard quoted from Isaiah, I believe he quoted, if not today, certainly yesterday, that God alone created the heavens and the earth. I also believe that Jesus is Jehovah. You'll find no argument from me there. The question is, is the Father there with the Son in creation? I believe the Bible is emphatic that he is. It's not just the Father that is there. It's not just the Son that is there. But it also is the Holy Spirit. While it's true that we are made in the image of God, we are not identical to God. 
We are not omnipotent. We are not omnipresent. We don't know the things that God knows. We cannot do the things that God does. Here we, ta- here we are told that we are made in God's image. After listening to Mr. Bernard's explanations and analogies, it, appeal- it appears to me that what many have done is attempted to create God in their image. We cannot look to ourselves and say, because I am this and because I have one name and I'm a father and I'm a husband, that is what God is like. We must look to the scripture. And the scripture declares that here in the opening verses of the Bible, God exists in an us. Well, what is the minimum number it takes to constitute us? It must be at least two, or else we wouldn't use such terms. If we saw somebody saying, let us do this or let us do that, we would say that this person is schizophrenic because they are, who are they talking to? But yet we find God here speaking to the Son in the creation of man, making him in his own image. And that is because the Son is eternally begotten. Please look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, where this verse, verse states, God, in, in verse 1 you'd find God, this is whom this is speaking of, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Notice the Father made the worlds by the Son. That implies that the Son was present in creation. It wasn't just the Father that made the worlds. It wasn't just that the the Father made the worlds through himself, but it was that the Father made the worlds through the Son. And then if you look again, at John chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Jesus Christ, speaking of the Son, it says that all things were made by him. And without him, not anything was made that, not anything made that was made. Let me read that again. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So here, once again, you see the Son of God. Not just God, but the very Son of God. Remember, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 are speaking in the context of Jesus Christ. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John goes on to tell us that the Word became flesh. It is this Word that is there in John chapter 1. It is this Word by whom Jesus is is called in John chapter 1, verse 14. It is by Jesus Christ that all the worlds were made. This is not something that's just limited to a few verses. This is something we find throughout Scripture. Look at Colossians, verses 16 through 19. Colossians 1, 16 through 19. Where we read, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, invisible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Who is this speaking of, the Father? No, the context tells us that this is speaking of Jesus Christ, the firstborn over all creation, which we read in verse 15. Jesus Christ most definitely was at creation. The pre-incarnate Son of God was there with the Father, discussing, let us make man in our image. In John 3, 17, we are told that it is the Father who sends his Son into the world. Now this is very crucial for you to understand. You cannot send your son into the Navy if your son does not exist prior to the day he is recruited. Therefore, you cannot send, God could not send his son into the world if his son was not in existence prior to coming into the world. And this is the same language we find in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. Mr. Bernard says that, that there are not two persons in the, God, but in the Godhead, but yet we find a conversation between the two persons. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, notice it is the firstborn that is being brought into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Verse 7, please. And the angels, and of the angels saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Notice it is the Father who says, Thy throne, O God. It is God speaking to God 
saying that the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom, and it will not depart, for it is your throne forever and ever. Now, Mr. Bernard believes that that is not true, that his throne is not forever and ever, for in his book he states that there will be an end to the role of Jesus Christ. There will be an end to his reign. And I have that quote available if you'd like to see it later. But all throughout Scripture, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is in existence, that he was there at creation, that he was there speaking from the bush with Moses on, in Exodus chapter 3. Jesus says, or, or rather Moses says, what is your name? He says, I am that I am. He doesn't say Jehovah, but he says, I am. Now, I agree that his name is Jehovah, but for some reason, God answered him and said, my name is I am. But yet, in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus says that unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Jesus is saying, if he's not the same God that spoke, amen, if he's not the same God, if he's not the same God that spoke to Moses from Exodus chapter 3, then you will die in your sins. However, you don't believe, or he doesn't believe at least, I don't know what you believe, he doesn't believe that that was Jesus speaking from the bush because he does not believe that Jesus is the Father. He believes that the Father is Jesus, but he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Father. That's what I said. What? I read it in his book last night. I can give you the quotation if you like. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. The Bible speaks of God, the Son, in terms of him being eternal. Not only will his scepter and his throne last forever, but he himself lasts forever because he is the Alpha and the Omega. Look at Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me. Oh, who is this speaking of? The Father is saying, from you one will go forth from me? Why doesn't the Father just say, I will go forth in him? He doesn't say that. He speaks from the standpoint of two persons. He says, from you one will go forth from me to be the ruler in Israel. And his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he is, as it says in the King James, in verse 2, it says that he is from everlasting, which we understand to be, there it is, have been from old, from everlasting, which we, ex we ex explain to be eternal. And I'm sure that we would at least agree about that. But who is this talking of? It's talking about the Son of God going forth from me. That is the Father. And his goings forth are eternal. To reject the fact that Jesus Christ is eternal, not only is to worship a different God, but is to undermine the direct revelation in the teaching of the Word of God. We cannot approach the Word of God in a natural sense and try to understand who God is. We cannot look around and say, well, because I don't see anything in my creation that, that models God completely as three persons. And because a man is only one person, therefore God must be one person, is a most dangerous and grave mistake that will, in fact, bear eternal consequences. I'm supposed to give a rebuttal of his speech and then he will do the same for mine. I would first like to say I do not believe that we worship two different gods. I do believe that he and I worship the same God but just have a different understanding. If I met the president and I recognized him as the president, if he met the president and, and he was dressed casually and he didn't know who he was, we would still have met the same person even though we have slightly different understandings of who that person is. Now, he said that he believes that God is three persons. He never tried to show anywhere where, where there is three distinct persons in Scripture. He never defined what he meant by persons, so I'm at a loss. If he means manifestations, I would agree with him. But if he means persons, I want to know, does he mean different minds, different bodies, different centers of consciousness? We don't know what he's talking about. He has not given any Scripture for that. Also, he said separate persons. 
The classic doctrine of the Trinity, as is defined by the theologians, says we do not believe in separate persons. We believe in distinct persons. So I want to know if he sees his view as different from the majority of Trinitarians or if what he said was an error and he wants to conform his thinking to that. Now, Genesis 1.26, God said. He interpreted that the Father speaking to the Son. It doesn't say the Father. It doesn't say the Son. It says God said. If God was speaking to someone else, there was somebody beside God who was there. If God is a Trinity, then the Trinity was speaking to some fourth person. And I want him to define who that person was. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. There's the explanation. Adam was the one creature who reflect the image of God. I know we're not like God in every way, but in this context, it is saying, this is my image creature, and this is a reflection. And so we would expect to see the reflection. Uh, Isaiah 44, 24 said, God did all, created all things alone and by himself. How can we explain that? Ephesians 1, 11 says, God worketh all things together after the counsel of his own will. He says it would be a schizophrenic God that would say let us if he's only one personal being and that if we saw someone do that, we would think they're schizophrenic. I dare say he and I both would be schizophrenic in that category. If you've ever sat down and said, let's see, what am I going to do today? Let us see. The royal Rui and Ezra and Nehemiah, you can read through it and you find kings that says we do this, we do that. And it was one king sending out a letter. If humans can say that, how much more cannot God say that? Hebrews 1, 2, creation by the Son. Uh, there was only one creator, Jehovah, who did it alone and by himself. The Son was not there as a separate person. However, the Bible speaks in, in uh, 1 Peter 1 and also in the book of Revelation, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When God created the worlds, he had the Son in view. He predicated all of creation on the redemptive plan of the Son because he knew without that redemptive plan, his creation would be destroyed. And so it's literally, the worlds is literally Ionos. In Greek, ages, he created all the ages. Abraham, when he came along, was with the son. He was delivered with the son in view. Moses saved with the son in view. All throughout the ages, it's depending upon the son of God. Another point, John 1, 3 does not say the Son created the worlds. It says the Word created the worlds. And that is God in self-revelation, whom we know to be Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 does establish Jesus as the creator. He wasn't creator as a separate person. He was a creator as God himself. If I say President Clinton was born in Arkansas, I don't mean he was president when he was born. I mean the man that I have met as president was born in Arkansas. Jesus was the creator. He wasn't the Son. He wasn't the Lamb when he was creator. But he he was the eternal spirit of the one true God. Hebrews 1 talks about conversations. Uh, he, he says conversations being persons of the Godhead. It's a prophecy from Psalms. It's the word of God speaking in Psalms that prophesies uh, of the Son. So it's not one God sitting beside another God talking to him. It's God said in Scripture, I'm going to have a Messiah. I'm going to have a king. He's going to come forth. And he's not only going to be a man, he is going to be the one true God. And remember, God has no equal. So if a prophecy says that Messiah is going to be the one true God, it doesn't mean another God. It means the same God we've already know, we already met. How, he says God speaks to God. If there's only one God, how can God speak to God? What definition of one are we using? That would be schizophrenic. I am, I do believe Jesus is the I am. I don't know where he got that. I do believe that Jesus is the Father incarnate. I said in my book, we do not say the Father is the Son, but the Father is in the Son, because Son relates to humanity. We don't say God is flesh, but God came in the flesh. But there's no question that Jesus is the Father incarnate, so he's misunderstood that. Uh, Bethlehem, that's again, that's a prophecy. The Messiah would come forth as God. Well, in his opening argument, he stated that he doesn't believe that God is, or I'm sorry, that Jesus Christ is a subordinate person. He says that Jesus is not subordinate. He said, quote unquote, he is not a subordinate person. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, he most certainly is a subordinate person. It says, but I want you to know, or, I'm sorry, I want you to understand 
I, but I want you to, to but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God if Christ is the father how is it that the head of Christ is God if he does not take a subordinate position this by the way is the analogy that Paul is giving for women to be in submission to their husbands, stating that just as the, the man is the head of the wife, so also God is the head of Christ. Well, if we say that Christ is not in subordination to the Father, then we should not ask women to be in subordination or submission to their husbands. But that is the very analogy that God uses. He uses the Godhead. I would like to make a, a clarification. If I did use the word separate, it was a slip of my tongue. I don't recall using the word separate, but I also understand that I'm a man that is prone to make mistakes. I would have preferred to use the word distinct if I did use the word separate, and I appreciate Mr. Bernard pointing that out to me. He said that we worship the same God. Uh, well, that, that's a very, very gracious statement for him to make, but does that mean that the Jehovah, the Jehovah Witnesses worship the same God? Does that mean that the Mormons worship the same God? How far off can we be on the nature of God before we are no longer worshiping the same God? He said, we both worship the same God, we just have a different understanding. Well, in that sense, everybody worships the same God because all religions are built on different understandings about who God is. So we need to be careful as we define our terms. The term person is something that is distinct from another person. That's what I mean, the word persona in Latin. It means a person. I mean, I, it's a very basic term I think that we use quite often. And I mean it in the sense that we most often would use the term. When I say that God has made himself known in three persons, I'm speaking of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It is seen in terms of one what and three who's. The one what is the nature of God. It is what God is. God is God by nature. We would look at a person and say, well, what is he? Well, he's a human. But yet, God tells us that although he is one in nature, he is also three. A perfect example of this would be Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go therefore and teach. Would you like to bring the... Oh, it's coming. Okay. Go, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, are these three the one God? Or are these three manifestations of God in three distinct persons? Or are these three uh, a, a plane of history in the way that God works as Mr. Bernard believes that, that one becomes another, kind of like actors on a stage that change their masks as they exit and enter into the stage of redemptive history. Now notice he defined in Hebrews chapter 1, I think this is very crucial also, he says that it's not God speaking to God, but it's the psalmist giving a prophecy about God. Well, this afternoon when you go home, I challenge you to open that verse because I, I hope that you are not willing to write that off with such a simple explanation because it most certainly is God speaking to God. The Lord God said to my God. That is the prophecy. It's not that the prophecy is being repeated and therefore it's God speaking about God. It is in fact that God in the prophecy is speaking to God. That's very important. He says it's about God the Father saying, I'm going to have a son. It goes beyond that. And I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I would ask you to, to look at that. Look at that, and you tell me if that's God speaking about him having a son or if it's God speaking to God. Now, if I understand it correctly, uh, I'm going to ask you questions and for 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes. And uh, were we ready to uh, begin? Okay. Okay. 
All right. Uh, I would like for you to uh, define persons more clearly. You said that uh, uh, you're using it in the way that we typically use it. Well, the way I typically use it, I would say those three men are three persons. But I see them as three persons. I can relate to one and not the other. And any non-educated, non-theologian would say, that's, if, those, if that's God, then you have three gods. Can you respond to that? Sure. Once again, we cannot make man, or rather, we cannot make God in man's image. And these arguments are an attempt to bring God down to the level of man. And because man cannot seen or man cannot be seen in three persons, he can only be seen in one person at one place in one time, that does not qualify as an argument that dismisses the fact that God has demonstrated himself in three persons, existing in the same place in the same time, having dialogue with one another, and even having love for one another. Okay. Uh, well, I would say then that uh, persons would be a human analogy since it's not a scriptural term. That's what I'm saying. I would not like to speak of God as those three men. So when you say persons, what do you mean? How would you define person? Persons I would define as being distinct from one another. Just as these three men are distinct from one another, so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct from one another. Yet they share the same nature. Okay, in that sense, these are all human. They share the same nature. So are no, you no. saying when the Bible says there is one God, you mean uh, not absolutely one like I'm one, but one like those three men are one? Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, these, these men do not uh, share the same nature, first of all. They each have their own nature. They're each humans by nature individually. Okay, that's good. When we get to heaven, uh, who are we going to see? Well, that's a good question. And the Bible doesn't really give us much information. However, John does have a vision of heaven. And John says that he sees... The father in the midst of the throne handing a scroll to his son, which denotes two persons. Stephen says that he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God in Acts chapter 7. So I'm assuming that we'll see the same things as those men saw. Okay. So if you're going to see two persons at least in heaven, then why when Jesus uh, and Philip said in John 14, Lord, show us the father, it will suffice us. And the Lord said, if you, how can you ask to see the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we were to go to heaven and you were to ask Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, would he give us the same answer he gave in the Bible or would he give a different answer and say, well, come into this room over here and I'll show you the Father? Well, in your question, you put words in my mouth because I never said that I would see God the Father. I never said that I would see two persons in heaven. I'm simply quoting what Scripture says, and that is that the glory of God was seen in Acts chapter 7 and the son was seen next to Jesus was standing at the right hand of the glory. In answer to your question regarding Philip, Jesus did not say, Philip, I am the father. If he had said that, that would have put this whole argument to rest. But it, what Philip is saying is that everything that the father is, is manifest in me. So if God the father were to take on a body, or if you were to see God in physical form, it would be an exact representation of Jesus Christ himself. Yes, very good. Uh, would you say is Jesus in the Godhead, or would you say the Godhead is in Jesus? I would say both. All right. How can someone be in the Godhead and also the Godhead be in them at the same time? Because Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and he possesses two natures. He is fully God, and he is fully man. Okay. How many Jehovah's, I assume your, my understanding is you believe that uh, the Father is Jehovah, the Son is Jehovah, and the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. And if I'm incorrect on, in my assumption, please correct me. And I would ask then, how many Jehovahs do we have? There is one Jehovah. You are correct in your assumption. Okay. And uh, I, I believe you would say the Father is, the, uh, is a, a spirit, the Son is a spirit, the Holy Ghost is a spirit. And you'd also say the Trinity has the spirit essence. So... Uh, does that mean there are four spirits, or how many spirits are they? And correct my assumptions if they're not right. Well, I never said that the Trinity has a spirit essence. Once again, that's putting words in my mouth. The Father is spirit. He is not, uh, the word spirit there refers to his, his ontological nature. It is what he is made up of, if you can use human terms. So the Father is spirit. Nevertheless, he is the Father. There is a distinction between him and the Holy Spirit, and then you have Jesus Christ, who is both God and man. So there are three persons in the Trinity. I'm not sure where you got the fourth. 
So what I'm saying is, like John 24 says, God is a spirit, or God is spirit, the modern translations would say. Is that spirit referring to the whole trinity, or it's referring to the Father, to the Son, or to the Holy Spirit? Well, it's referring to the Father. Okay. So when it says God is a spirit, you interpret that to mean God is the Father. I don't include the term A in there, the word A in there. It says God is spirit, and I assume that John is speaking of the Father because of the way he uses the term okay. God. So that would, you would say Father is spirit in that passage. Yes, if I would. Father is spirit and Holy Spirit is spirit, do you have two spirits or one? You have two persons, one God. How many spirits? One. Okay. One, one God. Spirit is, is the ontological makeup of the Father. Okay. So if you say that uh, we serve different gods, if we only understand Jesus and we're ignorant of the other persons, if we receive the one spirit of Jesus, have we not received the one spirit of God? Well, you cannot receive the one spirit of Jesus apart from a proper understanding of who Jesus is. Okay. Uh, you said that the Son is subordinate. Um, and I want to clarify, if you mean the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father, that is contrary to my understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, which says they're co-equal, co-eternal, and furthermore, it's contrary, more importantly, contrary to Scripture, Revelation 1, where Jesus said, I'm the first, the last, the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the Almighty. How can he be the first and the last when you say he's only second and has to get his orders from someone else? Well, I didn't say that he was second and gets his orders for some, from someone else. Once again, that's putting words in my mouth. When I say that Jesus is coexistent and co-eternal, I'm speaking of the nature of God that is resident in Jesus Christ. I'm speaking of his nature, not his position. His, in his position, he is subordinate. Therefore, Paul says, the head of Christ is God. All right. Uh, so if he's in position subordinate, but in nature he's, he's equal, is what I think you're saying. Would that be like a king and a subject? They're both human, but they have different positions. Or a master and a servant, they're both humans, but they have different positions. Is that how would you would see the Father and Jesus? I prefer to use the analogy that is used in the context of that verse, and that is the, the husband and the wife. Well, of course, we understand that in the flesh, Jesus was subordinate to the eternal spirit of God, and I think that analogy is very fine uh, in that context, but you're talking about an eternity, um, and so I'm wondering if you would see God as the head of the Trinity, as the king of the Trinity, as the, the one who gives the commands, and the son is the one who uh, carries out the father's orders? Yes, I would. Okay, that's uh, very clear. I thank you for that. Uh, also, I would like to ask, uh, I would like to s clarify that I do not believe in, in uh, God changing from Father to Son to Spirit, not as an actor on a stage going from one to the other. I believe in, in one God who simultaneously does whatever needs to be done, but I see that God is manifesting himself. Would you be comfortable saying that uh, God has manifest himself uh, in the Son, or God has manifested himself as the Son? Would you be comfortable saying God is manifested as the Holy Spirit? Well, manifest refers to uh, manifesting to someone. In this case, it's the human race. So th the question doesn't address the fact that God has always been the Son, or that the Son has always been God. So I, I, would, I would agree that God is manifest in the Son. Okay. So would you feel comfortable saying that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three manifestations of one God? Yes, I would. All right, that's great. Um, I would also like to ask about Matthew 28, 19. You emphasize that uh, Father, Son, Holy, the, the name singular of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So do you th see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three different names of three persons? Or do you see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as describing one name of one God? If so, what is the one name that it's describing? I would see it as the latter, the one name of the one God. Okay, what is the one name? Well, it depends on where, the, the one name. He has several names, but... Well, what's Speaking the one name that, you're ta that you just said it's describing? The God that is comprised of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, but like if I ask what is my one name, you would say David Bernard. If I ask what is the one name of Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, what name would you give me? Would you just say God? I would say God. Okay. Um, what is the only name given for our salvation according to the New Testament, Acts four twelve? 
Well, that's not what Acts 4.12 says. If you'd like to read the passage, we can, I can answer the question. Well, uh, time's up, but okay, what is the one name? Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that one name in Jesus that Jesus Christ. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, what is the minimum number of persons required to have a biblical loving relationship? To have a biblical loving relationship? If you're talking about human to human or God to human, then I would say, of course, you have two persons in that loving relationship. Okay. And if the Father is said to have loved the Son before the foundation of the world, how many persons would that ne necessitate? Well, if you're speaking of God in the incarnation, God looking down through time, seeing that baby Jesus to be born, he would love that baby Jesus, that man that would be anointed by him, and that would be one God, and that would be the human person of God, which is one person of God manifested in the flesh. If someone hands something to someone else, how many persons are implied? Well, there again, if you're relating to God and the Messiah, you have a unique situation in human history. If you're talking about two humans, than one human handing over to another human. But if you're talking about God in prophecy giving something to the Messiah, that Messiah could also be God manifested in the flesh. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 7, it says, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Who is it that's taking the book, and who is it that's sitting on the throne? God is sitting on the throne, the one indivisible God. Revelation 4, 2 is one throne and one on the throne. In verse 8, he's holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and was is to come. Revelation 1, 7 and 8 identifies that as the Lord Jesus Christ and his deity, the one undivided God. The lamb is the human sacrifice for sins. The lamb was slain. The lamb came out of the midst of the throne. So here we have a beautiful vision which uh, nothing could adequately describe the incarnation and atonement, but here we have God sitting on the throne, the Lamb coming out of the throne, yet the throne is not empty because God is omnipresent, filling the universe. The Lamb dies for sins, the Lamb comes back, and the Lamb is seated on the throne. In Revelation 22, 3 through 4, God and the Lamb is one person, one face, one name, seated on one throne. So why does John waste ink saying that the one in the throne handed the, the scroll to the lamb. Okay, this is a vision. We are not going to go to heaven and see a slain lamb walking around there. This is a beautiful description of how no one else could provide our salvation, but God himself provided the sacrifice. God became the lamb, but did not stop being God. And the lamb died, and yet God did not die. The flesh died. So if the lamb is the second person, the second person ceased to exist for a short period of time. But if the lamb is the human manifestation of the one God, the lamb could die and God could still be God. And that's why in Revelation 22, 3 through 4, it says, The throne, singular, of God and of the lamb, and okay, his servant shall serve him. Okay, there, that's fine. I'm, yes. That's an adequate answer. I'm just wondering, uh, I thought you said yesterday that the natures of Christ are inseparable. Yes. The natures of Christ are inseparable, but yet you just described the lamb as being the fleshly part of Jesus Christ. Well, the flesh died, but God was incarnate in that human flesh. And I do want to clarify, I don't think that the reign of Jesus Christ will ever end. He will be God manifest in flesh inseparably throughout all eternity. To you, is the incarnation of the Son of God mysterious? Well, there is an element that uh, transcends the human mind because how can we understand the infinite God coming in finite flesh? So 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Great is the mystery of godliness. And then it tells us, it reveals us, God was manifest in the flesh. It seems to me that you've explained a very thorough explanation and you do have a very thorough understanding. So I'm wondering what element of it to you is mysterious? Well, I'm saying I think I do understand what Scripture has revealed. It's not a mystery there's one God. It's not a mystery that Jesus is the one God manifest in the flesh. But I'm saying to think of the infinite God of the universe being shown in a little baby in a mother's arms, that is something too big for our minds to understand, just like eternity is too big for our minds to understand. Do you believe that... 
Let me skip that question because you've already answered it. Uh, in Philippians 2, we are told that Christ emptied himself. When did this emptying take place, and what did Christ empty himself of? Well, in Philippians 2, it starts off the passage by saying, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it said that he made himself of no reputation, and, and uh, he took on the form of a servant. So that's talking about in his humanity, in his human existence, culminating into his death. Isaiah says he poured out his soul in death. And Philippians passage says he was obedient unto death. And we're to emulate that. It's not talking about him losing any of his divine nature or, or, or identity, but it's talking about in his humble life, culminating in his sacrificial death, he made himself nothing for our sakes. In the sequence of events in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, it seems that he emptied himself before he took on the form of a bondservant. No. It says, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of flesh. So it was actually that act of taking on the flesh that was involved in the emptying process. Well, I think it's the whole process of his life and death put together. I don't think you can separate each, each phrase and say it's different. I think because in verse 8, he humbled himself. That it, it's not like he made himself of no reputation and then later he humbled himself. Well, if you make that yourself. Is, I'm sorry, but that is what it says because it says in verse 8, and being found in an appearance as a man. So there's a, a, the break in the thinking of Paul. But I guess I, what I would say is if I would say I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I'm tired, that doesn't mean I was hungry for one hour and then later I was thirsty and then later I was tired. I think the whole passage is describing the whole thing because it has to be because if he made himself of no reputation and then later he humbled himself, you mean after you have no reputation you can humble yourself more? I think it's all describing the incarnation culminating in the death. Does the Father indwell Satan? No. Does the Father or did the Father indwell Judas Iscariot? No. Not, not in his backslidden condition. In John chapter 14, verse 28, when Jesus says, I go to the Father, how is it that the Father is somewhere where the Son is not? Well, if you... Jesus was a man in every way like us except for sin. Everything we can say and do in reference to God, Jesus had to be able to say and do in reference to God, or, or he wasn't really our kinsman, redeemer, substitutionary sacrifice. So if I can say, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to be the Father, Jesus, as a man like me, speaking in his humanity, his human flesh, would ascend to heaven, the, the head dwelling place, so to speak, or the headquarters, or the manifested glory of the Father, he could say the same thing. I, as a man, I'm going to die, and I'm going to go to the Father. Thank you. Uh, if Satan does not or Satan is not indwelled by the Father, does that limit God's omnipresence according to the definition that you've given? No, because we're talking about two different things. When we say omnipresence, God is in every physical location at the same time, can relate to every one. When we say indwelt, I answer the question understanding you mean a controlling relationship such as a sinner, I would not say, is indwelt by God, okay. even though God is there. Given that definition, then, is Satan, in, is, is Satan present in, or rather is God the Father present in Satan? No, because I don't think you... Satan is not a physical being of space where you can say he's got a five gallons of empty uh, space and the Father is in that empty space. But if Satan exists in the continuum of space and you say that God is everywhere present in space, then that would also include Satan. Well, the Satan can speak to God. So if you mean, does Satan have access to the presence of God? The answer is obviously yes. If you mean Satan... Uh, has the Spirit of God working in his life? The answer is no. Well, I would, ag I would agree with you on that. However, if you say that God is simply omnipresent, therefore Jesus could, you could hear God's voice coming from heaven, God the Father's voice coming from heaven, although you say that Jesus is the Father on earth, and you explain that by saying, well, God's everywhere present at all times, and you yes. are forced to conclude that God must also be present, given that e explanation and definition that he is also present in Satan himself. No, because if I can say God fills heaven and speaks to the angels, at the same time God was incarnate in Christ, just because I say those same things, that has no relationship to God dwelling in the devil. Could the omnipresence of God mean that everything is present before the Lord? 
not but, not in the definition that you've given that well, God is everywhere present, but in well, fact, everything is present before the eyes of the Lord. Well, that's certainly true, but if I go to Africa, God's already there. If I go to heaven, I go. God's already there. If I make my bed in hell, Psalm 139, God's already there. That's what omnipresence means. He's already there. Does the Bible use the term omnipresent? No, the Bible doesn't use the omni term omnipresence, but it says God is everywhere. It says if I take the wings of the morning, he's there. If I make my bed in hell, he's there. Could it be that he's not physically there, but he is, in fact, there because it is born before his presence? Well, God is a spirit, so I don't know what you mean by saying physically there. But if you mean there's a phys any physical location where God is not, then I would disagree. Well, you've just given me one, and that is Satan. Satan is not a physical location. Satan is a spirit being. Well... I want to say, just have three minutes in closing, I appreciate the kind and courteous manner in uh, which Mr. Cook has uh, cooperated, and I hope that I've done the same. I hope that we can both leave saying that we've tried to be Christian gentlemen in everything that we're doing, and uh, no answer is intended to be antagonistic, uh, but just trying to be plain. We have to plainly identify our distinctives. I would say once again, if we have faith in the historic Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was born around the, you know, the turn 2,000 years ago, and we believe he's the, the manifestation of the one true God of the Old Testament, which I think Mr. Cook would agree with those statements, uh, then we do worship the same God. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that. Uh, they do not believe Jesus is Jehovah. The Mormons do not believe that. Uh, but we do believe that. So I think we do start in common. And from there, we both need to go through repentance, which I hope we've both done. We both need to go to water baptism in Jesus' name. We both need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, what difference does this make? It determines how we baptize. Acts 2.38 uh, says that we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And as uh, Mr. Cook has so ably explained, Matthew 28, 19 does not contradict that, but gives one singular name of God. Now, he thinks it just says God, but when you talk about salvation and repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost are all uh, a part of the initiation experience into the Christian church, then it makes very great sense that you would use the saving name when you come to entering into the church, when you come to confessing your faith in Jesus as Savior, which I think at the minimum both of us agree with, that's the purpose of water baptism, at least one purpose, then you would use the only saving name that's given, which is Jesus Christ. So I think the logic of both of our positions leads you to water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. What difference does this make? The, the oneness doctrine that I've tried to present says that our Creator loved us so much that He did not send someone else, but He gave of Himself. Sending does not require pre-existence as a different person, but sent into the world from that baby was sent from the womb of the Virgin Mary out into the world. But as far as pre-existence, it was the one God himself who came in that baby. Our creator loved us so much, he became our savior. And our Savior did not just die 2,000 years ago, resurrect, and go away to heaven, never to be seen again, but he comes back in the Spirit. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, Acts 18, 20. If the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit of Jesus, then Jesus is not with us today. But the beautiful truth is that our Creator loved us so much, He became our Savior. He comes back to work in our lives and dwell in our hearts as the Holy Spirit. When we pray, we don't have to divide our prayers and spend five minutes to each of different persons. But we can come to God in the name of Jesus. And all we need, ye are complete in Him. Colossians 2, 9, 10. Because everything we need, we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you. I, I did want to address this in the question cross-examination time, but I ran out of time, so I'm just going to address it briefly. I thought I heard him say, and I stand corrected, but I thought I heard him say that the reign of Christ will not end. 
uh, maybe he can clarify that at, with me after the debate, but on page 121 of his book, he said, the son's reign will have an ending. For when the church is presented to God and when Satan and sin and death are finally judged and subdued, the role of the son will cease. Is that what you believe? That the role of the son will cease? I thought he was our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. These are verses that you need to reckon with if you disagree with what I've been presenting with you today. Jesus says, I will send another comforter, John chapter 14. He says, God sent himself into the world. You know, if we had just one verse that said that, that would put an end to this whole argument. But it doesn't say that. It says God sent his son, implying a second person. That's what this is all about. I agree, well, there's many things that we have in common. There's many things that we have in common concerning our belief about God. To, under, to, 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 to say that Jesus Christ is not eternally the Son, when in fact He is, is to undermine the very deity of God and to interpret God and to teach God in a way that God has not revealed Himself. You see, we have doctrine in the Bible, and all doctrine is related to other doctrine. And so if you start off with a faulty foundation, you are bound, you are bound to build a house that is built on sand. And so it is with Pentecostalism. You start out with a misunderstanding about the nature of God, and the next thing you do is you have to change the, the baptismal formulation that Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize in. You have to make demands on people by saying, if you don't speak in tongues, then you haven't evidenced your salvation. But yet, does not Paul say, all do not speak in tongues? And so how do we reckon that? i just like to say that I also feel that Mr. Bernard's attitude has been very gracious toward me. I've appreciated the professionalism that he's demonstrated, and I've also appreciated your hospitality as having me come. And I hope that this may be the beginning of many discussions that we can have in the future. Thank you. Now, uh, we really appreciate both of these presentations. Let's give them both a hand right now. This is wonderful. Now, we were going to open it up for questions from the audience. And uh, if, you, if you have a cogent question, and, and not going to make ad hominem attacks. In other words, wait, 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 we have a format for this. Uh, number one, you're not to make a personal attack, all right, uh, against the, either one of the speakers, uh, but it, it should be a, a logical question, and uh, you need to stand in line here, and uh, we'll give you a microphone uh, to utilize. Could they direct? Now, you must direct your question, Mr. Cook, Mr. Bernard, and then the other speaker will have an opportunity to respond to the answer given also. Okay, so once again, you make your address. Praise the Lord. You, you have to do this in a proper manner. Uh, don't, don't come up here all emotional, just come with some sense, just like these men. I don't want any finger pointing and... Yeah, I'll let you know. And you address the individual you want to make the question to, and then the uh, other panelists will be able to respond to your, uh, the answer given, all right? Uh, we're gonna to try to limit this to um, four minutes. If, if we can. Let's try to limit each individual question, answer, response to four minutes, because we can go on a long, long time. All right. Go right ahead. Yeah, hi, this question's for Mr. Bernard. And I'll let you go ahead and read the verse, but I'd like if, if you could explain to us John 17, 5, please. John 17, 5. 
And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is here praying as a man. He prayed in his humanity, of course. He prayed in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 9. Uh, and so he was speaking to the Father. In fact, in verse 3, he says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So he's thinking as of the Father as the only true God, the full undivided God. So he is a man. He says, Glorify me with the glory I had with thee. He is talking about the crucifixion. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That is the supreme hour of glory. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1. And so in the plan of God, he was born for this hour. This was his hour. In fact, when he died, he was buried, he resurrected, he was glorified. The Bible speaks of him being glorified after, you know, the resurrection and ascension is the glorification. So he's saying, God, here I am as a man, humbly trying to do your will. The glory that you had planned before the foundation of the world. It didn't happen before the foundation of the world. It was planned. I want that glory to be manifested now. I'm ready to do your will. It's not talking about glory as a second person of the Trinity because if God will not share his glory with another, how, also, how could a, a member of the Godhead, if there were such, lose glory? How could God lose his glory and have to get it back? And finally, later in this chapter, he talks about sharing this glory with his disciples. He can't share his divine glory with his disciples, but his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, he did share with his disciples. I think this is just one more example of the two persons relating to one another. It does say that they shared glory before the world was. That's very clear language. That's very plain language. To say that that's not what it means is to undermine what, in fact, Jesus Christ is saying. There was a glory that he shared with the Father. I agree. God does not share his glory. Therefore, ergo, Jesus is God. The Father is God, but yet they share a glory before the world was. How can the Son of God, as God, as the God-man, not have his glory, as Mr. Bernard pointed out? Well, Philippians chapter 2 gives us that answer. He empties himself, and he takes on the form of a man. He empties himself of his glory. Um, I have a, Pastor Cook. Pastor Cook, I have a question out of John 17 and 3. Jesus Christ calls his Father the only true God. And later on, Thomas, who heard this prayer, said in John 20 and 28, My Lord and my God, if Jesus Christ considered his Father the only true God, then where did Jesus Christ get his Godhood from? Jesus Christ was speaking as a man when he said, my Lord and my God. Or, I'm sorry, in John 20, 28? Is that the, was that the verse? John, John 20, 17, 17, when Jesus three. says that he has a God? Okay, John, 17 and John 17 and 3, he calls his Father the only true God. And the word only in the Greek means alone, without any, without any other. Right, he's speaking of the nature of God. And to say that, I, th I thought that we were in agreement that Jesus Christ was also God. And so that seems that that verse would actually undermine your position because here Jesus is speaking of the only true God, but yet he's including himself in the same context. To answer your question about John 20, 17, how could Jesus have a God when he says, uh, do not cling to me for I go to my God and to your God? Jesus there is speaking of a man. And it was as a man, as a high priest, he could not be touched before he went into the Holy of Holy. That was written in the Law of Moses. Well, I think this is exactly my point. John 17, 3, Jesus is the only true God. He's speaking as a man. So two verses later, when he says, Father, give me the glory that, that I had before the worlds were, he, he's still speaking in that same position as a man. The glory that I had is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He wasn't hanging on the cross next to the Father before the foundation of the world. But he's asking as a man, give me that glory that was in your plan from the beginning. This question is for Pastor Bernard uh, regarding uh, chapter 3 of uh, John. And uh, it's really not a question. I'm just asking him to expand on verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. To me, that is an example that Jesus Christ, while he was God manifested on in the flesh on the earth did not lose any of his divine 
identity and nature. So even while he was on earth, he could say, I'm in heaven at the same time. Because as his spirit, he continued to fill the universe. The spirit of Jesus, the spirit of the one true God, was everywhere present, even while the son was physically walking on earth as a man. What's interesting about this passage is it uses the term son of man, which refers to the human nature of Christ. And so if we're going to interpret it the way that Mr. Bernard just interpreted it, then we're forced to say that it was in fact the Son of Man who has come down from heaven. Well, I'd, I'd be curious to know, in what sense did the Son of Man come down from heaven? If the Son is not a pre-existent, co-eternal being with the Father, in what sense does he come down from heaven? Once again, this points to the fact that he existed prior to uh, the incarnation as the Son of Brother Cook, my question is about baptism. Um, referring to Acts 2.38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then when you go down to uh, 47, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And in, in Ephesians 4 or 5, it says, There's one Lord one faith, meaning one doctrine or creed, and one baptism. There's only one right way to do it. Now, one, white, <clears throat> excuse me, one correct way to do it. Now, these people that were baptized in Jesus' name were added to the church by the Lord himself. The church meaning the church that we want to be a part of without a spot or wrinkle. So I, I have a question for you. You said we can't go around basically changing um, which we consider the Great Commission, but you said we can't go around changing the baptism. These men uh, were added to the church, God's church. So I would like to explain to you, I would like you, for you to explain what you mean by us changing. Sure. Changing uh, our baptism. I'm not sure uh, if we want to uh, get off the topic after this. Maybe we can ask that the questions are kept to today's topic because we're opening another uh, Pandora's box at this I point. I think he's asking about baptism in Jesus' name. Okay. Well, if you've ever been to a Baptist baptism ceremony, the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned. We are baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the name of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, the one baptism there is not speaking of water baptism. It's speaking of the spirit baptism, which also happened on the day of Pentecost, which is the baptism that unites. That, that passage is speaking of the unity of the church in the bond of love, and that bond is brought about by the unity that is, is held in common with those who are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Well, I would say in Acts 2.38, it says baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, there is an example of plain scripture. So to do anything other would be contrary to that plain scripture. Not only Acts 2, but all the other baptismal passages in Acts that use a name or a formula, they used exclusively the name of Jesus. Thank you. Pastor Cook, the question I have is, According to Luke 24, 47, let me quote it, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. According to this verse, the words of Jesus, were the baptisms in the name of Jesus from God or man in the book of Acts? Again, were the baptisms in the name of Jesus from God or or man, according to Luke 24, 47. Thank they were you. from God. Thank you. You want to make a comment, Pastor? Amen. Okay. Good morning. My question is for Pastor Cook as well, also on the baptism. Um, I'd like to know if you personally believe that the apostles were disobedient when they baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not at all. The, the question is, what does that term, name of the Lord Jesus, mean? Um, does that mean that they somehow were identifying those who were baptized with Jesus Christ? Or does that mean that they neglected the clear instructions that were given by Jesus himself? If there's any ambiguity whatsoever between what the apostles are doing and what Jesus commands, uh, we better do what Jesus commands. And therefore, there is no ambiguity because the Son is also included in the Trinitarian formula for baptism. Well, I would say that... Uh they did actually call the name of Jesus, just like in Acts 3. 
It said, then they raised the lame man, it says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And, and so they called that name. And baptism in the name of Jesus, same way, Acts twenty two sixteen, calling on the name of the Lord, literally invoking. And that would be the proper way to fulfill the instructions of Jesus. After all, Jesus didn't write that. Luke wrote it. I mean, Matthew wrote it. Matthew was there on the day of Pentecost with Peter. They all had the same understanding. This was how to fulfill the instructions of Jesus. Um, my question is to Reverend Bernard. And I just want to say that um, I believe that you have revealed for me this week um, the nature of God and that the um, revelation received in Matthew 28, 19, that would you explain further that you stated that the men or the, the apostles already before that scripture was written were baptizing in Jesus' name and they were just being obedient to the eloquence of the word that was given in 2819? Well, uh, I don't think they started the Christian baptism until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But what I'm saying is when, when Jesus spoke, baptized in the name, singular, of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, they didn't think of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three different persons. The very term, three persons, had not even been invented yet. And, so, and, and it was hard for them to think in those terms. They came from a Jewish concept, God is our Father. Jesus is the Son. God manifests the flesh. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. He explained all that clearly in John 14. So they had that understanding fresh in their minds. And so they understood that as to be a reference to the one name of God, who in their understanding previously might have been just simply Jehovah, but now they understood was Jehovah Jesus, Jehovah Savior, or Jesus. So later, when they went and carried out the acts of baptism, in their mind, they had it clearly he wants us to baptize in his name, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, what, uh, what we need to do is we need to realize that there is a shift in the emphasis here. Salvation is not a product of man's obedience. It, I hope there's not anybody in this room who thinks that they are somehow going to secure their salvation by maintaining the letter of the law. Salvation is of God. God is the one who saves. Those who are saved are then baptized. Okay, so we are not saved by some type of uh, vocal utterance or the vibration of our vocal cords upon baptism. That is to shift uh, salvation from being God-centered to man-centered. And that's not the case. It is God who saves. Good morning. I'd like to address this question to you. Um, in regards to what you just said, the Bible says, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Right. Also said that those who believe are baptized. Um, in 1 John 5.20, the word of God says, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true and eternal God, referring to Jesus Christ being the true and eternal God. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus and says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. It says one God. Paul mentions there is one God and Father who's above on through all and is all. Um, so my question here in regards to how you posed uh, his understanding, Pastor Bernard's understanding of the omnipresence of God, um, you asked if he believes that Satan uh, infills, excuse me, if God, the Spirit of God infills Satan. My question to you is, do you believe that? Absolutely not. Okay, so uh, well, why did you ask that? I'm just really curious. Because his explanation of God being manifest in more persons, in, in, se in se well, he doesn't like to use the word persons. Let's use his terminology, manifestations, at the same time such as the case in the baptism of Jesus Christ. When you hear the voice from heaven uh, saying, this is my beloved son, you see Christ coming up out of the water as the son of God, whose two natures are inseparable, and then you see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon him. He doesn't believe that those are separate uh, persons. Rather, he believes that because God is omniscient, God can be everywhere at once, and so that's how he explains away those verses. What I'm saying is if we take his explanation of what, how he defines omnipresence, then we're forced to concede that God is also present in Satan. Whereas the Orthodox 
understanding of omnipresence is that everything is laid present before the Lord. Not that God is in everything, not that God is in that speaker or in this microphone, but that all is made plain before the eyes of the Lord. All right, I'd, I'd like to respond to that. First of all, again, he used the word separate persons. Your, your thinking is totally in the line of three different beings, three different gods, and that's not just a mistake. You continue to do that because that's really the concept in your mind uh, when you're not paying attention to the theological definitions that have been taught. Now, uh, regarding Matthew 3.11, I'm not saying, I'm not teaching pantheism like God is in the microphone, God is in. I'm saying God is everywhere present. Just like, according to your theory, if God speaks or reveals himself in a vision to someone in Africa, Asia, Europe, and America, we could have four visions at the same time, four different people. And you would say, that's got to be four persons. I'm saying, no, that's got to be God everywhere at the same time. Now, in Matthew, we find the voice from heaven for the people's sake. We find the dove for John the Baptist's sake. These are signs. One God can give more than one sign at the same time without stopping to be one God. The people on the scene, if this were the doctrine of the Trinity, this would be the first time the Jews ever knew there was a Trinity. And they, you should find recorded all the crowd gasp in amazement. We thought, you know, Abraham only thought there was one personal God. Moses only thought there was one personal God. Now we see three persons of the Holy Trinity. What a great revelation. We have a new beginning. But instead, they just saw Jesus as the Messiah. If the people who were there on the spot did not look and say, wow, one, two, three persons of God, new doctrine, revelation, the Trinity, then how can we, just reading about it 2,000 years ago, come up with more than the people on the spot came up with? They just saw one God. Okay, I just want to say I was blessed by both presenters, and uh, before I ask the quick question, uh, I, just, I made some observations. Pastor Bernard, you quoted scripture in your opening statement 24 times. Pastor Cook, you quoted scripture 10 times. In the rebuttal, Pastor Bernard, you quoted scripture 6 times. You quoted scripture 3 times. And uh, uh, Pastor Cook, you stated that you are a man that is prone to make mistakes, and your direct words is, if we fight against truth, God will hold us accountable. Having said all that, here's my question. Uh, in John, Peter told Jesus, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus' answer was, I and my Father are one. When you see me, you see the Father. So could you please explain that? Pastor Cook. Sure. And we need to be perfectly clear that quoting the most number of Bible passages doesn't make any one position true. I don't think that there's anybody in this room that would think that. Um, to answer your question, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he's speaking of the fact that he is the incarnation of the Son. He's the second person of the Trinity. He is one with God in the sense that they share the only nature of the one true God. Okay. My, my response, God doesn't have a nature that can be shared. Uh, when he says, I and my Father are one, he says, you worship, you Jews, you worship the one God, the Father of heaven. You see me as a man walking down here on the earth. You don't see any connection. But I and my father are not two as you suppose. I and my father are one in the same. They got the message because they tried to take up stones and kill him. Not for his good works, but because you being a man make yourself God. They didn't say make yourself a, the Trinity or the second person of the Trinity. In the terms of hero is the Lord our God is one God. You're making yourself God. They understood what he was saying. They just got it backwards. He wasn't a man trying to make himself God. He was God who had made himself a man. I'd like to address uh, Mr. Cooks. Um, I first want to say that uh, baptism is, is truly important. Uh, it's a part of obedience. And obedience, obedience is the key factor in salvation. Uh, my question to you is, is that uh, Matthew 28 and 19, there are specific instructions about baptism. But... I have not found anywhere in the Bible any example where it was carried out other than in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you explain that, please? Well, I guess I'd have to ask the question, how many times does Jesus need to give the instructions for baptism in order for us to believe it? I would think that one would be adequate. If, if Jesus has given very clear instructions and we find something else that seems to contradict that, it's not as if God has changed his mind. We need to understand what's going on there. Are they simply saying that they were baptized in the name of Jesus because they were being identified with Jesus? Are they talking specifically, specifically about 
what the elder spoke when he dunked him in the water, or are they simply making a general statement and that they were associated with the Son of God, the one name under heaven by which all men can be saved? That's the first part of what he said. The second part is, I would agree that obedience is a very important issue, but you need to understand that no man will be saved because of his obedience. We are saved by the obedience of Jesus Christ. And if that's not the case, we're all in trouble. All right, I would like to respond, first of all, to the, the idea of Jesus only has to say at one time, yes. But we have to under, understand and fulfill what he said. If I say, go to the store and put something on my charge account, and somebody goes to the store and says, put it on his charge account. Well, who's him? Well, that's my dad. Put it on dad's charge account. No, who are you talking about? Well, David Bernard is my dad. So you have to actually fulfill, not just quote the words that I said, but actually do what I said. So in the book of Acts, the apostles called on the name of Jesus. When they cast out devils, they said, in the name of Jesus. When they laid hands on the sick, they said, in the name of Jesus. And I, I would not want to try to cast out devils and say, well, in his name, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I'd want to say, like the apostles did, in the name of Jesus. And the same way, so we need to understand Matthew 28, 19, the way Matthew, who wrote it, understood it and did it. That's all I'm saying. Now, in the part two, we're saved by grace through faith. We cannot save ourselves. That's true. But there has to be a response of faith to God. And faith is not a mental attitude. Faith is obeying. If you believe something, you do what it says. If you don't believe it, you're not going to do what it says. And I would argue we cannot separate obedience because... Hebrews 5, 9 says, speaking of Jesus, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, you who are troubled, rest with us, whom the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, I understand obedience is the response of faith. I'm not saying we're saved by our works. But to say obedience is not necessary or is not part of salvation goes against the direct teaching of Scripture. Uh, Dr. Cook, I have a question. In John 17, verse 6, Jesus said, well, I'll speak verse 5. He said, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them me. There's another passage where he said, I have manifested the Father's name. What name did he manifest if he said indeed that he manifested the Father's name? Well, if he's manifesting the Father's name, he is manifesting the name of Yahweh or Jehovah, the name of the God of Israel. That's the, the name. We, we need to understand that, the, that, that when, we, when the language the name of is used, and I'm sure that many of you do understand this, if not all of you, that it's not just simply speaking of the, 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 the actual name or the spelling of the name or the pronouncement of the name, but it's actually speaking of the authority that is ascribed to that name. And so Jesus comes and he proclaims the authority of God in the person of the Son of God. I would agree that the name represents authority, but the way that you actually exercise the authority is by using the name. I have the authority to spend the money in my bank account, but if I just write a check and, and don't sign my name, they're not going to honor it even though it's my authority. I have to use my name. And I think Jesus did manifest the name of Jehovah, but when he went around doing miracles, they said, Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus means Jehovah Savior. And so it was the name of Jesus that was manifest and broadcast. And when that happened, it gave glory to Jehovah of the Old Testament because that's who Jesus was. For the sake of time, we're going to ask no one come up. Uh, that'll be it. Whoever's in this line, that's all. God bless you. My question addresses uh, Pastor Cook. If the crucifixion and the resurrection and the day of Pentecost fell on 8033, and the book of Matthew was written between 58 and 68 AD, what was the original formula of baptism before that book was written? 
Well, the book of Matthew is the inspired word of God, and Matthew is quoting the very words of Jesus Christ, which obviously take place immediately after his resurrection. So from the standpoint of time, your argument doesn't hold water because Jesus makes that statement prior to the day of Pentecost, although it's not record recorded until after the day of Pentecost. I would agree with that explanation as far as time, but the more significant point would be the book of Acts, they were recording baptism in Jesus' name. So when Matthew comes 30 years later and they read it, are they going to say for the first time, wow, we've been baptizing Jesus' name all this time. We must be wrong. We have to change our formula. And I would say no. When they read Matthew, they said, yeah, Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We've been doing it right all this time. Praise the Lord. My question is to uh, Pastor Cook. Hey, Amen. I have a simple question. It's been asked, but I want to say it my way. And... The answer is pretty much a simple answer. But here we have uh, the disciples, and Jesus gave the commission, uh, go baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And then we have in Acts 2.38, when the disciples baptized in the name of Jesus. Would you agree that, and this is the question, they either got a revelation or they were rebelling? Neither. The Acts chapter 2 passage is not giving a specific formula for baptism. Acts chapter 2 is simply making a broad general statement that those who were baptized were identified with Jesus Christ. I have no doubt that when Peter instructed those who were baptized in that day to go into the water and baptize, he was obedient to the words of his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, here you're arguing from a non-existent verse the verse actually says Jesus and you're arguing it doesn't mean what it says now Acts 22 16 is an example Ananias told Paul arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord calling the Greek actually invoking so I would say there was an oral invocation of the name of Jesus in the baptisms of Acts my question is for Pastor Cook Pastor Cook, when God revealed himself to Moses as the I am that I am, which we know today as Jehovah or Yahweh, how then do you explain the writer of Hebrews in the 11th chapter, verses 24 through 26, speaking of Moses who did not know Christ, saying, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Well, to what extent Moses knew Christ is not given to us, but we do know this, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we are told that the rock that Moses struck was Christ. That rock was Christ, which would have been an excellent verse to bring up. I guess I should have brought it up sooner. However... <laughs> Simply put, it implies that Christ was there in the wilderness. And I, as, as Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, I believe that would also apply to Moses as well. And though they may not have had the full extent of the revelation given to us in the New Testament, obviously they did know that uh, God was going to send a seed born of a woman. That was the words of Moses in, in Genesis chapter 3. So there was a knowledge that God's son would be sent into the world and uh, to the extent of that revelation, I'm not sure what that was, but uh, I don't see a problem there. Well, this is a great example. They did know Christ as the spirit of the one true God. The rock was Christ. I don't see that that physical rock was physical Jesus. I think that's speaking of typology. But the point being, I would agree with him, they knew Christ. But notice, they did not know him as a second divine person. They knew him as the one true God. When he said, I am that I am, Moses didn't think, wow, there's a second person there. There's a new member of the Godhead. But he just thought that was the one true God. And uh, that's how he knew. And so if Moses and Abraham were saved by faith in the one true God, by faith in Christ, based on the future plan of atonement, but not thinking of two or three persons of the Trinity, I think our faith is the same today. Praise the Lord. My question is addressed to Pastor Cook. Pastor Cook, um, I have a two-part question for you. Um, 
the first part is regarding Isaiah 9 and 6. Um, when it says, when Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, and then in the latter portion of that scripture, it says everlasting father, um, the relation to for unto us a child is born, and um, everlasting father, could you explain that? And also in Acts 20 and 28, when um, the, the word of God records um, the church, which he has purchased with his own blood, um, which, which God has purchased with his own blood, could you also um, um, share, sh shed some light on it? That sure. Scripture. Jesus Christ is God in the form of a man. Therefore, there's no contradiction there. Uh, God purchased the blood, not only with the blood of his own son, but with his own blood, because Jesus Christ also is God. In reference to Isaiah 9-6, Jesus is called the second Adam. Adam is our temporal father. Jesus is the one who begets us to an everlasting life. So therefore, he is our everlasting father. The fact that he's called father doesn't mean that he is the father. It simply is a, an addressing his role. No more than if I say a dog and a cat are mammals, they're the same in that sense. I, Jesus Christ is the everlasting Father in the sense that he is the second Adam. All right. If Father were just a term of relationship, which is my position, then you could, in theory, have many fathers. But if Father is the unique name of one member of the Trinity, it's very strange that the second member of the Trinity would be given the name of the first member of the Trinity. That, that's confusion. The Son is the everlasting Father, the mighty God. It's not just speaking of his human role, but speaking of him as God, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And in that connection, Isaiah 63, 16, speaking of, of God, Israel speaking to God, thou, doubtless thou art our Father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. The same one who is our Father is also our Redeemer. Jesus is our Redeemer. He is also our Father manifested in the flesh. No more questions. No one else coming up. All right? Whoever's there is the last person standing there. Pastor Cook, this uh, question is addressed to you. It's more so addressed towards your view of the Trinity than my view of oneness, which I believe God has revealed and established in my heart through Scripture. But my, my question is this. You had established through 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, that man, or Christ is the head of man as man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. And you use that to establish that Christ is eternally subordinate, or Jesus is eternally subordinate to the Father. Now, to me, that's irreconcilable with the majority and traditional view of the, of the Trinity, which was established at the Nicene Creed, which says that they are co-essence, co-equal, co-eternal. Equality being distinguished from equity, meaning equal in all status, nature, and positionally. So how do you reconcile the Nicene Creed and your view of the Trinity? Well, you're defining the Ni Nicene Creed with your own definition. I'm defining that they are equal, co-equal, in the sense that they share the same nature. It is their nature that we are speaking of when we say that they are co-equal. Just as a man has a human nature and a woman has a human nature, and because they are both humans, they have rights given to them in this country, for example, uh, the woman is no better than the man. The man is no better than the woman. However, God has ordained a pecking order in that relationship, and so he has also uh, used himself as an example uh, to carry over in an, in an analogy of the relationship that he has, God the Father, with God the Son. So according to that, Jesus becomes second in the pecking order. He becomes like the slave to the master. And that is contrary to Scripture where Jesus said in Revelation 1.8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and what, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Under that definition, there's no way that the subordinate second person can be the Almighty. You cannot say in my household, even I do believe the husband is the leader of the family. I'm not sure I would talk about subordination in that same sense. But you cannot say my wife is the Almighty in the family. And you can't say Jesus said, the works that I do, the words that I speak, I speak not myself, a father dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. And so in the spirit, Jesus is the Almighty. In his human life and role, he was obedient unto death. 
And that's in the sense of subordination is his humanity, his uh, humbling himself to death. But in his eternal essence, if he's subordinate to some other person, then he cannot be the Almighty. Pastor Bernard, this uh, question is directed toward you. Uh, yesterday, after uh, you went off the air, the comment was made that uh, the belief in one God, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, had originated in the early 1900s. And we understand that that was actually Trinitarians that had got the revelation. But could you give us the information as best as you can on uh, who coined the phrase Trinity and when the Trinitarian doctrine really started because there seems to be a misconception that it started originally. All right. The actual word Trinity used for God, the Latin word Trinitas, was used first by Tertullian around A.D. 200. The phrase three persons and the phrase three persons in one substance was first used by Tertullian. Uh, so you have at least a hundred years after the last writer of the New Testament before anyone began to speak of God as three persons. Um, all throughout history, you've had uh, various concepts of God. But if you go back, of course, we believe the Bible clearly reveals the oneness of God. So that's where it comes from. You can go back to the Old Testament. I defy. Now, someone can, might say, uh, well, we find the Trinity hinted here, like Genesis 1, 26. But it doesn't say three persons. It doesn't say Trinity. It doesn't say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You have thousands of years of inspired scripture that there's, there's one God. And the Messiah would come and would be God. But you have zero scripture that says there are three persons in the God. Yet the first time in recorded history that you have there is one God is in the Bible. The first time the Messiah will be God, that's in the Bible. But the first time you have there are three persons in the God, it is A.D. 200 and later. And I would just say that if I was making my appeal from church history, uh, you might have a valid point. However, I did not make my appeal from church history. I made my appeal from the scriptures themselves, for they speak for themselves. Praise the Lord, Pastor Cook. Um, the understanding that you have of the Trinity is it that you believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, do you believe that they have power, share power, or they have separate power, each one of them? Well, their oneness is derived from the fact that all three are God. Oh. And so they all would be in perfect unity of mind and spirit and then of will. Right. And, and that would include power. And the Father is God. The Son is Jesus. The Son is God, and Jesus is the Son. Okay. And the so Holy Spirit when, is God. So when Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, that all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, that means he has all power. So as the God-man, he would have all power. But remember that that was a position that, uh, as the God-man, as also having human nature, that was a position that was given to him by the Father himself. He was exalted above all names. That's a, I, I agree with that answer. But notice, it's the Father giving that man, born of Mary, investing all power in him. It's not the Father giving an eternal second person his power to a subordinate second person, but it's Jesus as that man receiving the sole undivided power of the Godhead in his, the pre-incarnate God coming in the flesh and investing all his power in the flesh. Okay, hello Mr. Bernard. I'd like to uh, ask you, do you believe that all believers will eventually be one the way that uh, God and the Father and the Son are one? Well, if you're referring to John 17, I would say not as two persons of the Trinity are one, but in the sense that Jesus as a man submitted perfectly to God and was united in fellowship with God. That is the model for all believers to be in fellowship with God and with each other. Can you explain uh, verse 20 and 21? Of John 17? Yes. Uh, 17, me, 20, and 21. Okay, John. let me turn there and take a look at it. Interestingly, if this was talking about the Trinity, you would have the implication that believers could be just as much one as the Trinity. So there you'd have my three men down here being just as one as the Trinity, which I think he has already said he does not accept that. So you can't explain these verses from 
as referring to the Godhead, you can only explain them as referring to the man Christ Jesus in relationship with God. So from that perspective, verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So just as Jesus, that man, sent from God on a mission, has fellowship with Almighty God, so we are to seek to have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another in a perfect sense. Now that is not all that oneness with God means. This is speaking of Christ as a man. But in John 10, 30, you have a oneness that transcends uh, humanity when he says, I and my Father are one. And then John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now I can say this man and I are one in the sense of unity, like Christ the man was with God. But I can't say if you've seen me, you've seen that man. Even with my wife, we become one flesh. But I can't say if you've seen me, you've seen my wife. So Jesus also spoke in other passages of a oneness that transcended the oneness we're talking about in John 17. And I would simply comment by, by repeating what he just said. God sent the man Christ Jesus into the world that denotes at least two persons hi I've got a quote by Tertullian who lived in 160 and allow me to read it uh, he was an African apologist and theologian and we define that there are two the father and the son and three with the Holy Spirit and this number is made by the pattern of salvation which brings out you about unity in Trinity Interlating the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three, not in dignity, but in degree. Not in substance, but in form. Not in power, but in kind. They are of one substance and power, because there is one God from whom these degrees, forms, and kinds devolve in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then I have other quotes from Origen. And, um, but can you please explain to us the Church Father's view of God? Okay. And, um, and uh, did the view of God, or did the view of who God was then change over 130 years? Okay. Uh, Tertullian was born about A.D. 160, but the writings you're referring to are A.D. 200 and later. And that's a good example. If you, you can also read elsewhere in his writings against Praxius where he said the majority of believers who always, or I will not call them simple and unlearned, but they do not understand my doctrine of the Trinity in unity. They think that my doctrine denies uh, the rule of faith and denies the scriptures. And so in the same breath that he said, well, I believe in the Trinity, he said, most of my contemporary believers disagree with me. They think I'm compromising the oneness of God. Now, Tertullian and Origen will be the first writers that speak in Trinitarian terms. So that's A.D. Uh, 200, origin about A.D. 220, 225. But if you go the century before that, you don't find those kind of things. You find some leanings in that direction like with Justin, but you'd hardly want to claim him because he put Jesus as not really the true God, but just as a lesser God. And he was not clear at all on how he saw the Holy Ghost. He, he said the Holy Ghost and the Holy Angels have the same nature. So the farther you go back, the less you see the concept of the Trinity. If you read the writings of Ignatius, he would say, Jesus Christ, our God, with no explanation, oh, well, he's a second person. So, I, yes, I would say in 100 years, 135 years, there was a gradual shift, not among the vast rank and file. As Tertullian admits, the vast rank and file did not accept him. It took another 100 years before that would happen. But if you think that's unreasonable to suppose that in 135 years that could be that shift, well, look at the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s. There was a drastic shift of millions of people in 100 years. Look at the 20th century, the Pentecostal movement. Uh, there's a drastic shift in millions of people in that time from their previous tradition. So that happens all the time. Uh, I would agree with... Uh, Pastor Cook, that uh, we can't go to Tertullian origin to learn anything about the scriptures. We've got to go to the scriptures. Amen. And that's why we open our Bible to Genesis chapter 1, and there we see, let us make man in our image. You know, this question is for Mr. Cook. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6, it says, Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day 
that I am he that speaketh, behold, it is I. And how do you connect that as well with St. John chapter 8, verse 24, that says, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, if ye believe not that I am he. Ye shall die in your sin. How do you connect that in the plan of salvation? Well, I think what Jesus is saying there is that he is not only the man that was born in Nazareth, but he is also God manifest in the flesh. Now, Mr. Bernard would, I'm sure, agree with that definition. However, it goes beyond that. Jesus Christ is the one saying that he is the I am of Exodus chapter 3. He is the very one. And it's not, he, he mentioned a few mo moments ago in the context of this type of a question, that when Moses saw the burning bush, he didn't say, oh, it's, a, it's another manifestation of a God. Well, if you read those passages, and I would sincerely urge you to, to read those uh, pre-incarnate appearances of God, you will find that it was, in fact, an angel of the Lord, and then the angel of the Lord is further identified as God himself. And so the angel in that sense is not the angel in the, in the sense that we use angel in the New Testament. However, the term angel was a messenger. So here you have a messenger of God, but yet it is, this messenger is further identified as God himself. Well, I am is the one true God who became incarnate as Jesus Christ. Obviously, God is a spirit. He's invisible. No man has seen God at any time. The Bible says, John 1.18, so the only way God could appear in a manifested form is looking like an angelic being or looking like a, a human being, something tangible to our senses. So, of course, there are passages that speak of God appearing in angelic form, but that doesn't require a second person. One God can appear in an angelic form without dividing himself into two persons. So I would agree that Moses and Abraham and others they saw the pre-incarnate Christ, but not as a second person, but as the spirit of the one true and living God. Okay, um, you said that... Um, Cook. You said that when we get baptized in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now isn't those, aren't those titles? Because what is the name of those people? I mean, because I'm a mother... What is the name of those people? Yeah, of, of, of the Father. Well, first of all, they're not people. They are the, the identification of the one true God revealed in three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And it is in the name of the one true God that we are to be baptized in. And so when we use that language, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are identifying ourselves with the God of Israel. Well... I know people is not a term he would like to use, but when I asked for a definition of persons, he said it's how we use the term in ordinary speech today and distinct, making them distinct. So by the same logic, you could say the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are three people, not human people, but divine people. That's really the implication of, of the terminology that he's chosen to use. Now, uh, what I would further... Uh, Let's see, what was the verse that she quoted? Did she quote? Oh, the Matthew 28, 19. Well, yes, the name is singular. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are, if you're going to say that's the name of God, that's three names. If you see them as titles, then you understand there is one name that those titles describe. And so I think he's close to our understanding if he would just see the name of Jesus is the supreme name. Praise the Lord, Pastor Cook. Um, I, I just wanted to um, bring out two scriptures. Uh, one scripture comes out of John 3, uh, 3 8, and it talks about uh, where the wind bloweth and listeth, uh, no man can tell. And then I want to, would like to go on to 1 John. 1 John 7, and it speaks of, it speaks of uh, there's three in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these are one, not as one, but these are one. And then it speaks, uh, I would just like to have an understanding that the wind blows from north to south to east to west, but it is still only one wind. And, and I, I just uh, would like to see what... Uh, what What's your question? Uh, my, my question would basically be, uh, uh, how, how do we consist of this being as an entity, as being three different areas, but yet as a spirit, as God is a spirit, as it speaks of, 
that, that he can be of any place at any time and still be as a consistency of, of, of different areas. Like the north wind is still the wind. The south wind is still the wind. The east wind is still the wind. It is not a separate entity. That, uh, uh, but when two winds come together, they form a tornado. <laughs> so your analogy falls short. Uh, I would simply say, I would simply say that um, that in Acts, or I'm sorry, John chapter 3, the first verse you brought up, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from, where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus is simply saying that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is not something that can be seen with the natural eye. And just as the wind is not something that is visible, however, we can see the effects of the wind. We can see the, the, wind, the leaves blowing on the trees and so forth. So we see the effects of the Spirit, however, we don't see the Spirit himself. But remember, remember the same John records the words of Jesus saying, he is another comforter in John chapter 14. He's not the same comforter as Christ, but he is another comforter. He is the Spirit of Christ. However, he is also described as another comforter. And the, the, I, I'm surprised that uh, you, you quote 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, because uh, my experience with those who hold to the oneness doctrine is that they don't really uh, uh, use that verse simply because there is some some uh, question about if it should exist in the original manuscripts. Um, if you think it does exist in, in the Word of God, uh, it, all it does is confirm the Trinitarian position. I've been saying all along that these three are one. They are the one true God, but yet we see them conversing together, we see them loving one another, we see them sharing glory before the foundation of the world. We can't simply explain away those verses. We have to understand what God has revealed about himself. Well, when you see love and communion and, and fellowship and all that, it's God speaking of Jesus Christ, that baby who grew into a man who was the Messiah and is a perfect role model to show how we should have love and fellowship with God and how God loves us. First John 5, 7, if you want to use that, speaks of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Oh, you can know me by my word, but that doesn't make my word a different person. You can know my spirit, but that doesn't make my spirit a different person from me. And uh, when it's talk, uh, you refer to a verse that he did not mention. What, what was that? Uh, no, the verse that he did not bring up. You brought John uh, 14, John 14, 16, another comforter. If you continue reading it, it says, Jesus says, if you just stop another comforter, you might say, okay, there's another God that I don't know about. But if you say, but you keep reading, even the spirit of truth, you already know him for he's with you. Well, who was with him? Jesus. But shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And so he's saying not another person, not another God, but another form, spirit rather than flesh, another relationship in you instead of with you and then to cap it all off confusion confounded if you think they're different persons I will not leave you comfortless the Greek as orphanos from which we get the word orphan I will not leave you as an orphan I will come to you when I come to you as the Holy Spirit I will be your father this is to Pastor Cook and also to Pastor Bernard uh, Mark the 16th chapter and the 16th verse, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. And then my scripture goes on to say to explain that the signs accredit the gospel message and cannot be limited to the apostolic age any more than the Lord's commission to carry the gospel throughout the world. The signs therefore confirm the ministries of Christ's ambassadors in every generation, casting out demons, speaking in tongues, and healing 
all appear throughout passages in the New Testament. And I heard you say that you're believers, you're Trinitarians, you believe in God, we're believers. Growing up in the apostolic faith, I have been at the bedside of people who have recovered. I have seen devils cast out of people. These signs followed the apostles who believed and taught and preached this doctrine. These signs follow those in the apostolic movement who believe and teach and preach this doctrine. What type of signs are following Trinitarians? Our initial, our initial contact and experience and proof of the Holy Ghost entering our lives is a glossolalia, I believe it's called. We speak in new tongues. There's proof there that you can audibly hear that the Holy Ghost has entered in. I know that you can confess Christ and believe in your heart that, you know, you're saved that way. I know that people believe that. But Trinitarians, what type of signs are following the Trinitarian belief is my question. Well, Jesus said it's a wicked an adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. So that's my response. The words of Jesus Christ, he says, if you're looking for a sign, it is a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. Romans chapter 8 says that is his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are in fact the sons of God. I would say uh, we don't seek after signs. We don't follow after signs. Signs follow us. These signs shall follow them that believe. All right, let's, please, let me finish. I, I didn't anticipate that response, but uh, let me just finish. If, if somebody was trying to derive their doctrine from signs, then what he quoted from Jesus would certainly be accurate. But there's nothing wrong with saying we get our doctrine from Scripture. Now let's see if our understanding of Scripture is, is right. Do we see it actually happening? Do we see it actually coming to pass? And so signs can confirm what we've already learned. And the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and confirmed unto us by them that heard them, God also bearing them witness. So if you want to talk about the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, here's how. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. It's God that gives the signs. I can't make the signs happen. But if God heals somebody or God causes someone to speak in tongues, tongues, who am I to say God can't do that? I would like to uh, speak on the behalf of the apostolic group of people here, if, if I may, uh, that we uh, love you, Mr. Cook. I would like to ask a question and I'd like to address it to both Mr. Cook here and uh, Brother Bernard, I'd like for you to expound on it first, if you would, Mr. Cook. Uh, and uh, the, the question is, is, who is the image? I'm quoting out of, first, uh, out of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Who is that, speak who is that speaking of? I'm, a I'm asking that question. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus Christ. I would agree, and that points out, if it was a second person who is the image of the first person, the second person is just as invisible in his eternal state as the first person. It's not a second person who reveals the first person. It's the man, Christ Jesus, the hu human personification of the one God. And he is not a second person, but Hebrews 1, 3 says the express image of his, God's person. 
The Son is not a second person, but the express image of the one person of God. Thank you for allowing me to come in. Perhaps I'll exercise uh, as a presenter, but thank you for allowing me to. I could not sit still. Uh, when I hear someone refer to the Trinity uh, and is not biblical, then you bring in history. And so on that, to the tale of that, the father of the Trinity, who took Plato's Timaeus, twisted it into the Trinitas, forming a three-sided three -sided figure, forming three gods, and in the course of about a hundred years, evolved into three persons, co-eternal, co-equal, uh, and so one of the fathers I would just like to quote, and that's uh, Eusebius uh, of Caesarea Philippi, which we all honor, right, as a greatest historian, uh, born about uh, 265, dying around 339. He was at the Council of Nice, and this is what he had to say. He said, go with one word and voice, he said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all the nations in my name, teaching them to command, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, that was also recognized by Coney Bear, one of our greatest 1901 Hibbert's journals, also by Harnack, Harnack's dogma, also by Moffat in the historical New Testament, as being, not being baptized of baptism, nor Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but that Jesus said, having been misquoted and taken out of a context and added baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Have you heard this before? No, I haven't. Good, I'll give you a copy of this. Uh, Are you saying that Matthew 28, 19 doesn't belong the way it is? is that it what you're does saying? not belong. It was changed probably by Josephus, uh, third, uh, by Jerome, rather, and it ended the Latin version of the Vulgate, and then when... Uh, Wycliffe translated a thousand years later. Uh, he translated it with them looking over his shoulder, and he did what he was bid to do. Uh, and then uh, Tyndale translated into the whole Bible, which for doing so, they caught up with him in England, burned him at stake, uh, because he dared to change the Roman Catholic's version. And so the Trinity belongs to the Roman Catholic. It is a Roman Catholic, and all the daughters of Roman Catholic mistakenly uh, accepted it, uh, but uh, my question, uh, since you brought in the history, I did then not. I had to introduce it. You mentioned I, I did not appeal to church history. Well, you mentioned it by Trinity. Okay, my next, my question, First John five seven is also spurious. It has no place in the Bible, and you'll find that in most of your Bibles, your Bible will tell you that it should not have been there before the fourth century. I did is not. Is that right, uh, yeah. Mr. Bernard? I did not raise First John 5, oh, Well, 7. you mentioned for, uh, First John 5, 7, so, all right, my, I'm trying to get to a question. How can I formulate this as a question? Because you quoted spurious uh, scriptures by bringing in 28, 19, as baptized in my name, uh, and also First John 5, 7. So I'm asking you if you would look and examine, and I'm going to give you this piece right here. It's out of Proof of the Gospel by Eusebius, 1920, and it's being printed right now i'm picking it up next week uh reprinted uh and i'd be glad to supply you with a copy of that um, and what well, is my question i guess it more, maybe it's more Ask of a statement than a question uh, okay well but how, how do you reconcile the, the, those scriptures which have been uh interpolated well i think that your your dispute would be uh, with both Mr. Bernard and myself I, I think that we are both in agreement that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 belongs in the Bible I don't want to put words in his mouth I'll let him speak for himself I didn't raise first John 5 7 I did not appeal to church history uh, I, I was I was um, implying that first John 5 7 is seen as a spurious addition and that's why I said I was surprised that it was brought up to defend the oneness position so I did I am in agreement with that um, but beyond that, I don't really have anything else to comment on except for, and I wanted to say this with the last person that asked the question, that I too love all of you. And if I didn't, believe me, there are much many more things I would rather be doing on a Saturday morning than sitting up here in the hot seat uh, fielding your questions. So.
I think we're in agreement on Matthew 28, 19. The Greek texts uh, that we have do have the verse the way it's worded, so I'm content with that. Uh, the case of 1 John 5, 7, the Greek text that we have do not have it, and that's where the question arose. But I do think there's a significant point. Eusebius, before the Council of Nicaea, several times in just referring to Matthew 20 and 19, said, you know, Jesus told his disciples to go and baptize in, it, in his name, in my name. So before the doctrine of the Trinity was really a contentious issue, and before Matthew 20 and 19 became seen as a proof text for the Trinity, it was seen as basically supporting the Acts accounts. So I don't really want to get into textual criticism because that goes beyond what our audience is familiar with. But I would be very willing to say this is a significant point that, that our elder has raised in that it shows that even the, in history up until uh, around the Council of Nicaea in 325, the most common interpretation was say, oh, Matthew 28, 19 is referring to the name of Jesus. And it's only later that they begin to think that it was referring to three different names. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Um, we have a, a question from Bishop Duncan for Pastor Cook. I'm in Genesis 3, 22, uh, where it mentions, uh, behold, they have come one of us. Um, what happened to the other us? Uh, referring to Genesis 1.26. What's the who, question? I'm sorry. The question is, who did he become like? Who he did has, man become like? No. In, in Genesis 1.26, he said, let us make man in our image. Right. But after Adam and Eve sin, the Lord says, behold, he's become one of us. Right. And the question is, what happened to the other us? I mean, who did they become like? Well, he's saying that they have become like one of us in a particular sense. Uh, we were already made in the image of God, and so there's another sense in which we were already like God. But we, the, the text actually defines it knowing good and evil. Uh, that is that man now had a knowledge of good and evil, which prior to his fall, Adam was unaware of what evil was. God being perfect and complete in his knowledge uh, understood from the beginning what evil was, and he witnessed it in the person of Lucifer uh, upon his rebellion. And I would say the probably the most likely interpretation of Genesis 3:22, one of us referring to the angels also knowing good and evil, because that in the same passage, God set the cherubim to uh, guard just a few verses later to guard the garden. Uh, so I think he's probably, and that's the the historic. A Jewish explanation is God was uh, speaking of the angels when he said man has now become as one of us. So I basically would accept uh, Pastor Cook's explanation, but just further point out that the angels would also good, know good and evil and could come into the context of that passage. I have a question now. Okay, um, in the uh, Trinitarian doctrine you have the eternal God, the eternal Son, and the eternal Holy Ghost, correct? And it's turned... God the Son, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Now, my question comes is, it was God the Son, the middle one, who came down and manifested himself as a man. That's my position, yes. Okay, that's your position, okay. So when that man was created, did he have a separate human spirit? No. When he was created? Yeah, when, when the, I'm talking about the man now. When the man was created, was his spirit the spirit of God the Son, or was his spirit a human spirit? Well, that's a, a, well, that's a, a question that unfortunately I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. I would have to say, I guess if I think about it, that, um, I mean, my first inclination would be that he had um, a spirit that was uh, divine in the sense because he's, he doesn't have a sin nature. There are some differences between Adam, I'm sorry, between Christ and all others that are born in Adam. There's right. a sub significant difference. So if he possessed the spirit of Mary, uh, that could imply that, that uh, there, was some, uh, there was some of her nature that was carried over into him. I, to, quite honestly, I can't answer that question. Scripture doesn't answer that question. And uh, I don't want to go beyond what is written. Okay. All right. Before you go, Pastor Bernard, I, so then that leads me to the next question. 
If then it is not true that the man Christ Jesus did not have a human spirit just as we have, but he had the spirit of God the Son, then that does not make him fully man. That would be a natural conclusion on the one side. Then on the, on the second side, if then you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and then when God the Son came down and became a man and had a separate human spirit, you got four spirits now. You got the spirit of the Father, you have the spirit of God the Son, and you have the spirit of God the Holy Ghost. Then you have the spirit of the man, Christ Jesus. So now you got four in the Godhead. Well, the spirit of the man, Christ Jesus, wouldn't be included in the Godhead. Okay, so, so then all of our debate then that we're having is over the manifestation of how a God, whether it's God the Son or Almighty God, became a human being. The question is, is not whether God the Son came down. The question is, is God came down and became a man with a separate human spirit. Therefore, you have God, the eternal Father, manifested in true humanity. It's not that simple. <laughs> okay. Let me respond. I think it's unquestionable. I, I would not say a separate human spirit. I would not use the word separate. I would say... But we have to say that Jesus had humanity in spirit, otherwise he's not fully human. He groaned in spirit. Was that the eternal God groaning and suffering? No, that was a man. Father, into thy hands, thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost or gave up the spirit. Was he given up an eternal spirit? That's a human thing. We commend our spirit to God when we die. We give up the ghost or give up the spirit. So scripture is very plain that he had a human spirit. Not a separate human spirit, but a human spirit joined to the divine spirit. And this really goes to the heart of everything we're talking about. Because if he did have true human identity in his human spirit, he could pray. In his human spirit, he could ask God to help him. In his human spirit, he could commune with God. He could love God and God could love him. If he did not have a human spirit, then the Trinitarian position would be much more plausible because it would have to be two to eternal spirits communicating. But if he did not have a human spirit, then he wasn't really human. He couldn't be our sacrifice of atonement. So I believe Jesus, not a sinful spirit, but I believe true humanity and true hu deity was united in his spirit and so that he was a true man. But at the same time, always remember, he was, the spirit of God was fully incarnate in that man so that he was truly God manifested in the flesh. With further explanation, I think I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Bernard that he did have a human spirit. But once again, I don't know everything, and this is one of the things that I should study further, uh, and as we all should study some things further, right? 